I want to go to First Chronicles chapter 12. I'm going to talk about um, um, the men who made David great. It's the title of this message. The men who made David great. David is one of the only kings in the Bible where it actually lists the mighty men of David. It actually lists the people who helped establish his kingdom. And, you know, these people, David inspired something in them, and they, and they came to, to join him, not when he was actually king, and, you know, he was not crowned, and the whole nation was with him. David was a fugitive. He, he was running from Saul. If you remember, he killed Goliath, and then he was raised up in the court of Saul, and then Saul got jealous of him because Saul knew that he was going to be the next king, and so Saul tried to kill him. David ran for his life. He was in the caves. He was running, hiding, you know, just trying to survive. Saul was chasing him with thousands of warriors in, 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 you know, to try and kill him in the forest, in the caves, for a number of years. And then the Bible says that men began to gather to David. He was still a fugitive, and he was still not king. But they began to gather to him. And these men came to him that had certain qualities, certain, certain gifts, certain abilities, and they joined their hearts to David while he was still a fugitive. And these people gave, and they were the ones who established his kingdom. And what I feel like God prophetically through this is speaking to us as a church, as we come to the close of 2016 and we go into 2017, I really believe that, you know, that God wants to establish his kingdom in the Inland Empire. He wants to establish his kingdom in our lives, and I really believe that we as a people and as the people of God are joining our hearts to the son of David, who is Jesus. We're also joining our hearts to this church and to what God is doing in this church, and we're here to establish the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And the qualities that these men brought to David are the same qualities that we need to uh, imbibe and we need to learn from if we're going to be successful in establishing the kingdom of God in our communities, in, in our cities, and in our country, and in this state of California. And so this, this, has, got, this has had so much truth, this First Chronicles 12, we can only look at a handful of, cha of verses but we're going to just delve into a handful of them and let's pray God speaks to us prophetically concerning our lives here today. Amen? Amen. So we'll pick it up in, 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 in verse number 1. It says the, these words. It says, Now these were the men who came to David at Ziklag while he was still a fugitive from Saul, the son of Kish. And they were among the mighty men, <clears throat> helpers in the war. How many of you figure we're in a war? This is a daily war. We're in a battle. We're in a war every single day. Armed with bows, using both the right hand and the left in hurling stones and shooting arrows with the bow. They were of Benjamin, Saul's brethren. We're going to come back to that in a moment, but they came from the tribe that was in power. Remember, Saul was Benjamin. That was the tribe that controlled the country. They left that and they joined David. We'll talk about that in a moment. But the point I want to bring out here is that it says that they were armed with bows using both the right hand and the left in hurling stones and shooting arrows with the bow. Now, how many of you are right-handed in this building? Is there anybody here who's left-handed? Always a handful. All right, and... It's an amazing thing that when we're born, most of us are born with a, with a natural side of us that is stronger than the other. So that when we come to pick up something to throw it, we will naturally gravitate to the side that is stronger. Or we will kick a soccer ball, or we'll kick a football, or whatever it is. We will normally, you know, use the right hand or the left hand in, in doing a task, depending on which side is stronger. But the Bible says that these men could hurl stones and, and throw arrows 
they could shoot arrows with the right hand and the left hand equally well. Which is the principle behind what these men had done was that they had taken the weak side of, of their ability to, to, uh, to do a skill and they had strengthened it to become exactly the same as the other. And this is the principle. All of us have strengths and all of us have weaknesses. And we, if we want to really establish God's kingdom, we cannot just gravitate in our lives to what we're naturally good at and what we naturally will normally do. All right, I myself, as I go to 2017, I'm looking at the areas of my weakness. I'm looking at the things that I'm not good at, the things that I really struggle in. Uh, number one, I, I'm, I'm very strong in the Word of God. I'm very strong in prayer, but I'm not strong in worship. It's just an area. I can't sing. I don't have a good voice. I can't play a single instrument. I don't have that natural tendency. It is not my right hand. It's my left hand. And so... I want, as I go into two, because I, I read the word, and worship is such a vital part of the kingdom of God, but it's just not an area that I ever gravitate to, but I know that I have to strengthen it. I have to learn to worship. I have to learn to press in into that holy place. I've got to learn, and I've got to put some emphasis into it, and I've got to strengthen it so it becomes as strong as the other areas of my life. There's areas that, you know, Lisa and I have a tremendous work ethic, and we'll, you know, work tirelessly, travel the world, and but you know, the area of exercise and fitness in that area, it's a weakness. It's an area that we have to strengthen in 2017. All of us have strengths and we have weaknesses, and all of us have to strengthen what's weak. Are you with me, church? Amen? Because if we want to establish God's kingdom, we cannot have vulnerable points in our lives where the enemy can take us down. Many years ago, I heard of a, of a, of a mountain climber who um, was from the United Kingdom and, and he was a very uh, well-known mountain climber. He had climbed Kilimanjaro and many other parts and many other major mountains in the world, but he had never climbed Mount Everest. That was the, that was the crown jewel. That was the, that was the mountain he always wanted to climb. And, and so, after many years, he said, you know, I'm going to put together an expedition and he gathered some of the best climbing friends that he had and he, he planned and mapped out an expedition to go to Nepal and to climb Mount Everest. Well, they, they, they trained, they prepared, he raised money from family and friends and finally they went and they, and, they, and they went to try and climb the very first time. They only got about halfway up. Do you know that 25% just about of all the people that climb Mount Everest die? It's not an easy mountain to climb. They got, you know, about halfway up and they were forced to turn back and they realized that they just, they were not up to the task and he came back home to the United Kingdom and he was extremely discouraged. But, you know, he wasn't a quitter. He said, you know, we're going to go again. He put together now a, a, a more experienced group and he, again, they prepared for about six months and they got themselves into better shape and they studied their mistakes and um, he raised money again from his family and friends and he went a second time and this time they got about two-thirds of the way to the top. But bad weather came in and all kinds of issues happened and with the oxygen and whatever else it was and they were forced back home. And he again was very discouraged but he just made a decision in his heart. He says, I will not quit. And this time he put together a third expedition. They prepared for an entire year. He studied the mountain. He studied the weather patterns. He studied everything. He studied those that had made it, those who hadn't. What they did, what they hadn't done. He, you know, they changed their eating patterns. They got into incredible physical shape. And as he was about to go on his third expedition, he gathered his family and friends, the people that had been supporting his expeditions in a giant, you know, a banquet. And he got up to thank them for supporting him, even though he hadn't made it to the top of Everest. And as he was speaking to this group, behind him was a giant photograph of Mount Everest. In the middle of his talk, he stopped. And he turned around and he pointed at the mountain and he said these words. He said, Mount Everest, he said, I will conquer you. He said, because you cannot get any bigger. 
but I can. And he went that time and they conquered the mountain and he got to the summit and he overcame it. Now many of us in our lives, we've got mountains that we're facing. They, they seem insurmountable and they seem like there's no way we'll ever get to the top of them. We'll never conquer them. But you know what? You can grow bigger than your mountain. You can strengthen the areas of your life that are weaker. And you can get to a place where your faith, where your knowledge, where your training, where your understanding will conquer whatever mountain God has allowed to be in front of you. Amen? For many years we were at uh, Cottonwood Christian Center with Pastor Bayless Connolly. And, you know, Pastor Bayless um, had a wonderful family there, uh, David Martha Johnson. He owned a, a carpet business, and, and they were a faithful, faithful family. Three beautiful children. The, fa- the, the couple were in their 30s, and they served God faithfully in that church. And one day, Dave came to Pastor Bayless, and he was just crying, and he was just completely distraught. And, and Pastor Bayless said, what's, what's wrong? He said, Pastor, he said, we need a miracle in our family. He said, we just came back from the doctors, and the doctor said that Martha has a year to live. There's no cure to the disease she has. There's no known way that she can get past this. We need to get our house in order because in a year's time she will not be with us. He said, Pastor, we've been serving God faithfully. He said, I believe that the scripture says that we need to call the elders and you need to come and lay hands on her and God's going to heal her. We just believe that that God's going to do a miracle. We need this. Pastor Bales was about to go and pray with, to, for Martha, when the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, she's not ready for this miracle. And he stopped himself and he turned around and went to his bookshelf and he took out a book and the book is called Christ Our Healer by a guy called Bosworth. And it just goes through the scriptures of all the places where God heals in the Bible. And he said, Dave, he said, I, 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 what I want you to do first before I come and pray I want you and Martha just to go through and just, I need you to strengthen your faith in God's ability to heal her. I need you to put the word of God into you. I need you to strengthen this area of your life. And he said, you know, please, will you take this book and just read it with Martha? Dave was not happy. He stormed out the back of the church. He was very, I mean, he was upset. And he he basically, you know, didn't come back to the church for over a month. Pastor Bales was heartbroken. He thought, I've lost them. They've, they've, they've become offended and they've left the church. And he finally got enough courage to pick up the phone and he called Dave. He said, Dave, I didn't want to offend you. He said, I'll be happy to come and pray for Martha. On the other line, on the end of the line, Dave's voice was just super excited and he said, he said Pastor, you, you don't know what's going on. He says, we've been reading that book every single day. And every single day, he says, something's going on in Martha. And we, I just, we knew our faith was just growing in the God's ability to heal her. And said, Pastor, as we were reading yesterday, we came across Isaiah 53. And as we began to read those words where the Lord says, Surely he has borne our sicknesses and carried our diseases, and by his stripes we have been healed. He said, as we read those words, he said it was like electricity went through her. He said, Pastor, we just came back from the doctor. The doctor says he has no understanding of what happened. He says, but there's not a trace of the disease. It's now more than 30 years later. She's serving God. She has grandchildren. And her faith grew bigger than her mountain. Are you with me, church? 2017 is a year to strengthen the areas in our lives that are weak. To make them just as strong as the areas that are strong. We go down to verse number 8. It says, Some Gadites joined David at the stronghold in the wilderness. Mighty men of valor. Men trained for battle. Who could handle shield and spear. Whose faces were like the faces of lions. And they were as swift as gazelles on the mountains. A very interesting um, phraseology here of these Gadites. The Bible says that They were mighty men of valor, men trained for battle. One of the the great values of, of, of my life is I so believe that we all need to be trained for battle. We're training all over the world. We're in 147 countries. 
and we you know, go into very difficult and persecuted nations and, 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 and see the hunger that there is there for people to be trained in the Word of God. And none of us in this room would ever want an untrained pilot to fly them and nobody would want an untrained doctor to operate on them. You wouldn't want to go for a stomach operation. You know, they prepare you on the gurney and you're, you're, you're just lying there and the doctor comes up to you and he's behind his mask and you see sort of smiling at you and you're kind of trying to get a little bit of affirmation from him and you're just trying to get some sort of, you know, hoping that this is going to be okay and you say, doctor, I, you know, I hope... I hope that, uh, you know, that, that, that you trained many, many years to do this operation. And the doctor says, oh, no. He says, I haven't trained at all for this one. And you say, doctor, well, I hope you've done many of these operations before, that you've watched other people do them, and, and, and you know that you, you've had years of experience of seeing other people do this operation. And the doctor says, oh, I... I I just needed you to know I'm a Christian doctor. He says, I, 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 I'm just going to pray. And wherever God tells me, I'm, that's where I'm going to cut. <laughs> no one of you going to stay on that gurney. You'll, you'll, you'll fly off that thing and get out of there. Because you don't want an untrained guy operating on you. You don't want an untrained pilot to fly you. And how much more in the things of the kingdom of God? You know, when this coming year, I, we need to be trained. That's why the Rock Bible College is here, and that's why the, 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 all the tremendous programs and the, and the courses and the things that God's given into this church, it's to prepare you, it's to train you. I remember when I had my first time that I, that I encountered a demon. I mean, I was at university, University of Michigan. I mean, a secular place, and... You know, I was, I was saved, and, but I had never encountered a demon. I grew up in a British, very conservative family that, you know, we didn't even believe demons existed. So these stories in the Bible, they didn't really make much sense to us. But demons are real. And I tried to pray for somebody who was demon-possessed, and I didn't know, but, you know, I was praying, and I was praying that God would touch them, and a demon manifested. And then I was, like, freaked out. I was like... I do not know what it, I was completely out of my depth. And I'm there and I'm in the basement of the, of the dormitory in the University of Michigan and I'm like, Lord, I don't even know where to begin here. And then I remembered that there were some other guys on campus that were even more radical than we were. And uh, they were part of a group and there was a guy called Hunter and I just remember, I had his phone, his number and I called Hunter and I said, Hunter, I need you here. Here came a guy who was trained for battle. And I just remember, because I was sort of there in the corner, like with my eyes closed, so that I didn't want to even look at this thing, and this guy's writhing on the floor and all the rest of it, and this guy walks in the room, and he walks right up to it, and when the Bible says their faces like faces of lions, when you're trained for battle, you're not scared of the enemy. And I remember he went in there and he just spoke to that thing and he said, look at me. And the person stopped and froze and looked at him and then he took authority and broke that chain and that guy was delivered in, in, in just, I mean, in maybe 15 seconds. And I watched the guy completely free and all the stuff was gone and I looked at that and I was like, whoa. Because I wasn't trained for battle, but he was. And when we're trained for battle, we don't run away. The Bible says they're swift as gazelles on the mountains because when David faced Goliath, he didn't run away from him, he ran at him. In so many areas, we need to be trained. Trained in whatever area. Lisa and I just such a believer. I went out this weekend and I bought a book this thick on, you know, Facebook marketing. I'm like, Lord, this is, the, this is the next front of how we're going to reach this world. We're going to get them through these media, social media. I'm going to learn this thing. I'm going to have to be trained in it. There's so many areas that we need to be trained for battle. If we're going to be used by God in 2017, let's get trained for battle in Jesus' name. Amen?
Let's go down to verse number 16. It says, Then some of the sons of Benjamin and Judah came to David at the stronghold. David went out to meet them and answered and said to them, You've come peaceably to me to help me. My heart will be united with you. But if you've come to betray me to my enemies, since there's no wrong in my hands, may the God of our fathers look and bring judgment. And the Spirit came upon Amasai, chief of the captains. He said, We are yours, O David. We are on your side, O son of Jesse. Peace, peace to you, and peace to your helpers, for your God helps you. So David received them and made them captains of the troop. These people left the tribe that was in power, and they joined themselves to where God was moving. They made a decision of the loyalty of their hearts of saying, you know what, I'm going to leave the traditions of my, my family, my heritage, my background, my tribe, my, my, my natural loyalties, because I'm not interested in my natural loyalties, I'm interested in my God loyalties. I'm interested in where God is moving. I'm willing to violate things that have been in my past, and I'm willing to let them go, because I want to be where God's moving. I want to do what God wants me to do, and I want to join myself to where God is active and where He is moving. Amen? Amen. Very tough choice in many cultures of the world is that area of loyalty of heart. But it also deals with the areas of our heart because, you know, David had to test them and say, you know, what's in your heart? Where are you really at? Because this is like the guy from the enemy coming and saying, I'm going to come and help you. You know, one of the things that I know that's so strong in this church, and, and Pastor Jim and I are best friends, and I just, I love the heart. Pastor Jim talks about, you know, just going into the, the, the food lines. And he goes and the people don't even know who he is. And he, you know, puts his baseball cap on there. And, and he goes in there just to hand out. But he's not going there just because they need help handing out food. He's going there to make sure that his heart stays in the right place. That the loyalty of his heart is connected to, to seeing the people, to seeing the need. There's a reason I go to the mission fields. I try to go every year, two, three or times. I go all over the nations of the world. I go into persecuted countries, sometimes days without showers and days without, you know, decent food. And going into these places, I go there because I want to keep my heart in the right place. I want to do things for the right reasons. I don't want to be a hypocrite, and I don't want to just do things and go through the motions. Are you with me, church? There was an amazing evangelist. There was a woman evangelist. I'm not going to give her name. But she had crusades all over this nation. And she, you know, she was doing tremendous work for God. But she had hired six people in her office. And these six people, you know, had really allowed the enemy to come in. And there was gossip and there was all kinds of just real, just, I mean, strife and conflict in her office. And this woman would go out and she would do these crusades and fight the enemy. She'd come back to her office and there was fighting in the office. And she said, Lord, I, I'm paying them good salaries. They've got benefits. They've got everything. Lord, what, I, what am I supposed to do? And the Holy Spirit gave her wisdom. And she came in one morning at about 8 o'clock in the morning and she gathered her staff together and she said, you know what, I've been praying about things. She said, all of you are, willing, are, are welcome to continue to, to serve the ministry. She said, but from this day forward, you need to do it as a volunteer. Well, five out of the six, I mean, they just, they just got furious. They went back to their desks. They took a cardboard box. They put all their stuff into their cardboard box. They went back, back out into the, into the parking lot. They screeched their tires and they left the building. But the sixth lady... She came to this lady. She came to this evangelist. She said, you know, I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills. I don't know how I'm going to feed my family. I don't know how I'm going to take care of the needs that I have. She said, but God called me to work for you. And God is the one who placed me in this office. And she said, I will not leave until God moves me on. She said, you just got rehired and your salary just got increased. 
Amen? Because she was the only one there for the right reasons. And that's what David says to these people. He says, you know what? Are you here with the right reasons, with the right motives, with the right heart? And the Bible says that Amasai says, the Spirit of God came upon him and said, we are yours, David. We are on your side, son of Jesse. Peace, peace to you and peace to your helpers. Your God helps you. As Amasai made that decision with the right heart to join himself to David, the Bible says the Holy Spirit came upon Amasai. And as we have the right motive in joining ourselves to the work of God here at the Rock, the Spirit of God will come upon us. And God's anointing will be upon us. And His grace will be upon us. And His, and His, and His power will be with us. Amen. Let's go down. Now, Pastor Jim, when we, just before service, he prayed, and I felt like we, I just need to bring in this verse. It's not going to come up on the screen, but it's verse number 22. It says, For at that time they came to David day by day to help him until it was like, it was a great army like the army of God. And I really believe that God's going to bring thousands into the rock, thousands and thousands into the rock. There's going to be a great army of God that God's going to bring in. Amen? So we go down to verse number 32. It says, Of the sons of Issachar, who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, their chiefs were 200, and all their brethren were at their command. These people, the sons of Issachar, they had a spiritual discernment. They understood what was going on in the nation. They understood what was happening. Let me tell you, we are in extremely strategic times in our nation. Lisa and I, you know, we are very open to the prophetic word. We don't crazily chase the prophetic word, but we do listen to it. We do try and discern what God is doing. And if you do any type of research, you'll know that even concerning the election that we had, that God prophetically spoke many things into the global church and many things into the body of Christ. And if you, there was a, just recently Kim Clements, they had a two-hour special. He passed away a few months ago. But they did a two-hour special and the prophetic words that God used that man to speak, just, I mean, specifically about things that are happening in the nation now. There was a fireman who's in 2011, God gave him prophetic insight and these are not things that we, we try and plan our life around, but we do try and discern the season, discern what God is doing. And we are in a very opportune time, I believe, for the church that we need to take advantage of this next open doors that God gives us. We must not squander an opportunity that God's given us. We cannot just say, oh, well, no, we're just going to go on like business as usual. I'll tell you, God has opened a great and effectual door. He's given us a tremendous opportunity. He's given us incredible uh, potential of what He will do on our planet in these next years. And we as the church need to step into them. We need to be like the sons of Issachar. We need to understand the times and know what we ought to be doing. And this is not a time to be a spectator. This is a time to be a participator. This is a time that we need to get engaged, to be involved. We need to be a part of establishing a kingdom. We need to establish what God wants to do on this planet. We need to be a part of reaching a generation for Him. We need to be a part of reaching a planet for Him. Are you with me, church? We need to be like the sons of Issachar. You know, Joseph in Egypt, he knew what was happening. He discerned the dream of Pharaoh. He saw the seven years of plenty, the seven years of famine. And Joseph prepared the entire nation of Egypt to prepare to be ready for that. Joseph's brothers were in Canaan. They were from the same family. They came from the same lineage. They came from the same heritage. They had the same promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were children of Israel. But they saw nothing. 
So Joseph prepared for seven years. And Joseph saved the entire known world of his day. And when the famine hit, all the brothers could do was come and beg. Because they never discerned the time. They never saw what God was doing. They never understood what the season and the time was. Let's be like Joseph. Amen. I have one final point. Let's go down to finally to verse number 33. We'll pick it up in the second half of verse number 33. Of Zebulun, there were 50,000 who went out to battle, expert in war with all weapons of war, stout-hearted men who could keep ranks. Remember that statement. In verse 35, of the Danites who could keep battle formation, 28,600. In verse number 36, of Asher, those who could go out to war, able to keep battle formation, 40,000. In verse 38, all these men of war who could keep ranks came to Hebron with a loyal heart to make David king over all Israel, and all the rest of Israel were of one mind to make David king. Four times in about six verses, God brings this concept that these men that established the kingdom of David had this one quality, they could keep ranks. They could hold together. Probably one of my most favorite scenes in any movie is Braveheart, the little ragtag team of, of, of soldiers, these Scottish, you know, my roots are Scottish, and so I, you know, identify. I haven't painted my face, you know, blue yet, but, you know, it's coming. <laughs> but this little ragtag team, and there's Braveheart in the front of this thing, and they all together some sticks there, and, and this massive army of the British comes, and they've, I mean, they've got all the... There's horses with the cavalry, and they got their lances, and you know, and the, and this this entire army begins to storm them, and they and just comes at them with full gallop. And this little ragtag team is there, facing this army, and all that Braveheart says four times, he just says the word "hold," hold. And this thing gets closer and closer. And of course, they, they dramatically build it in a fantastic way. And this, this, this cavalry gets even closer and jumps over these, these, these mounds and comes closer to them. And I mean, they full gallop. And he says, hold, hold. And at the final moment, four times he says that word. At the final moment, he says, now. And they lift up these sticks and these horses run into them and they win the battle. Had they not held rank, they would not have won. We as the church, you know, when you're in a military situation, you know, it doesn't really matter if you like the person on your right or you like them on your left. Or whether the guy in front of you smells very good or the guy behind you looks very good. You know what? You only have one ear, and that ear is to a commanding officer who's giving commands. Amen? Amen? And you will only win in your ability to hold rank, in ability to march together. And when the commanding officer says, go left, you can say, well, I really think right is a much better uh, choice here, but you know what? They're going left, I'm going right. You will not survive. Amen? And sometimes we don't really know why we're going left or why we're going right. But God uses the authority that he places over our lives to help give us direction as to where we're supposed to go. And that, that commanding officer is the one who's in charge. We need to learn to hold ranks because in this 2017 and going forward, we have to actively work on unity. We've got to work on running, on, on running together. We've got to work on holding rank. We've got to work on marching together because we will win if we hold rank. Amen? These men knew how to march together. I'm going to close with a true story out of West Africa. 
of a, an evangelist. His name was Simon. Lisa and I were missionaries in, in Nigeria for two years. And this evangelist was, you know, just one of those fantastic, obedient servants of God. He would go with a little backpack on his back with all of his possessions in there, and he would preach the gospel in the village, and then he would help establish a church and, and stay there a while, and then the Holy Spirit would say, hey, move to that next village and go and do the same there. And he would just obey the commanding officer. He would go from village to village preaching the gospel. One day, as he was traveling between two villages on a dirt road with jungles on either side of the road, and as he was worshiping God and just praising God and just going along the road, he heard the commanding officer. And it was just a scripture that God spoke to him. The Holy Spirit said, Preach the gospel to every creature. He stopped and he was so clear in his heart and he sensed that God was saying it, but he stopped and he turned around and looked for somebody to preach to. But there was nothing. There was nobody. There was no, nobody around. And so he was confused. So he started, you know, walking a little bit further and he heard again, preach the gospel to every creature. And so as he was looking again, he suddenly heard a rustling in the leaves and up above he saw a troop of monkeys and they were swinging in the trees. And he said, he said, God, surely you don't want me to preach to those monkeys. But you know, he didn't hear any further. He just had that one command and so he thought this is a test. So he put his little backpack down and he took out his Bible and he opened up and he started in the book of Genesis. And he started with Adam and Eve. And I'm telling you, he preached a full gospel message to those monkeys. They didn't even listen. They just kept swinging in the trees. And you know what? I mean, he told them about Adam and Eve. He told them about the fall of man. He told them about the, you know, uh, Abraham and Isaac and the Passover lamb. And he got down finally to John chapter 3. And he told them about being born again. And he told them about Jesus being lifted up from the earth and dying on the cross for their sins. And I mean, he felt the presence of God all over him. He felt so good. And so he finished his message Monkeys just kept swinging in the trees, put his Bible back in his backpack, and he started to march on. And the commanding officer spoke again. And God said, you forgot to give an altar call. <laughs> and now he thought the African sun was really getting to him, you know. And he's like, okay, God. He says, you know, I says, this really must be a test. He says, but you know what? Let's do it. And so he put his backpack down again. He went to the edge of the road there. And he said to those monkeys, he said, Now if any of you today want to give your life to Jesus Christ, he said, I want you to come and kneel right here in the front of the road. <laughs> the monkeys just kept swinging in the trees. They just kept going back and forth. And just when he thought he had gone completely out of his mind and gone completely crazy, he suddenly heard another sound and it came from the bushes underneath the monkeys. And out of the bushes came a lady and a second lady and a third lady and a fourth lady. Eight women came out from under the bushes. They had been on that road and seen a strange African man coming and they decided we're not going to have any trouble. And they dive behind the bushes. And all the time that he's preaching to those monkeys, they're hearing the gospel. And all eight of them came and knelt in the road and gave their hearts to Jesus Christ. Church, we sometimes do not have to understand everything. Sometimes we just need to obey. Sometimes we listen to the commanding officer and we say, yes, sir. Because God knows what he's doing. He knows who he's reaching. He has his own purposes, his own reasons. And if we learn to march together, if we learn not to hold rank, if we learn to flow in unity, we learn to flow in the power of the Holy Spirit. And if we can put these things, if we in 2017 can strengthen the areas of our lives that are weak, 
that we can get trained in those areas that need training to enable us to be strong and have faces like lions and be able to face the enemy. And if we can get our hearts right and have loyal hearts, you know, that join ourselves to the work of God for the right reasons, and we can discern the times and the seasons that we're in as the church, and we understand where we are and what we ought to do right now, this is a time not to be a spectator, but to be a participator. And if we will march in rank, church, we will win battles, and multitudes will flow into this church, and great things will happen for the kingdom of God. Amen. With that, I want everybody's eyes closed just for a moment. And I want to just ask even the question that that evangelist asked and said, is there anybody here where tonight you need to make Jesus Lord of your life? This is a, an eternal question because all of us will stand before God. And Jesus made it very, very clear. It's not just because you came to church that you're going to get into heaven. He made it clear that it's not because you're a good person. People think I'm going to go to heaven because I'm good. You will not make heaven if you, just because you're good. The person who asked Jesus that question was one of the goodest people that you can find. He was a Pharisee. He was a person who was a, a person who understood the scriptures, who was an extremely, extremely good person. But Jesus said, you will not make it. You'll not make it because of your family. You won't make it because of your history, your heritage. There's only one thing Jesus said that you have to have happen in your life. The Bible says that Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3, he said, you must be born again. And the only way to get born again is when you make a decision to personally give all of your heart and all of your life to Jesus Christ. It's an all or nothing decision between you and God. Jesus came and, day and gave his life. He gave everything for you. He died on a cross for you. He gave himself for your sins and for your salvation. And he's the only way to heaven because the only thing that can remove sin and open up the way for you to be allowed in heaven, your sin has to be forgiven. And Jesus gave his life to enable that to happen. But just because he did it does not mean that you appropriate it. You have to personally accept it. You have to personally say, Jesus, that death on the cross was for me. It was for my sins. It was for my salvation. And you have to personally accept Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior. That's a decision between you and God. Nobody can make it for you. You don't get to heaven because your parents or your grandparents or anybody else did that. It's a decision that you have to come to. I was 12 years old and I'd been going to church almost my whole life when I understood that I personally had to accept Jesus Christ. And I was in an Anglican church in the middle of Africa in a stone chapel. And I remember praying that prayer and inviting Jesus Christ to be Lord of my life. I walked out of that building and I said, something's changed inside of me. And a friend turned to me and said, you just got born again. I said, what does that mean? And now I understand. When Jesus comes into your heart, when you personally accept him as Lord and Savior, he transforms the inside of you. He forgives your past and he changes your future. And he changes you on the inside and transforms your nature. So I want to ask and give every person here tonight an opportunity. If you've been running from God instead of to him, I, this is for you tonight to respond. If you've never given him all of your heart and all of your life, if you've never made him fully Lord of your life, you have an opportunity right now to do so. So I'm going to ask as I count to three, in a moment, in time, I'm going to be doing that. I'm just going to count one, two, three, and I'm going to clap my hands together. When you hear that noise, I want you to raise up your hand wherever you are in this building. I want you just to raise up your hand. And when you're raising up your hand, you're saying, I don't just want to come to church. I want to accept Jesus personally into my life. I want to be born again. I want to find a true relationship with God. I want to make sure that I'm headed for heaven. That's what you're doing. If you've been running away from God, if you've maybe once served Him and now you need to come back to Him, I want you to raise your hand as well. On the count of three, let's all do this together. One, two, 
three. Let me see your hands wherever you are. I see your hands there. If you need to make that decision, I see another hand back there. Anybody else that needs, I see a hand over here. Anybody else, I see a hand over here. If you need to make that decision tonight, anybody else that needs to do that, I see your hand over there. God bless you. These are the best decision you'll ever make. My life changed at the age of 12 and I've never been the same again. I've had a personal relationship. Jesus has been in my heart. I've never, never had a day without him since that day. Is there anybody else that needs to do that tonight? You need to make Jesus Lord of your life. Just raise up your hand wherever you are. If your heart's beating, it's, it's okay. Let's do this together. Anybody else that needs to do that? All right, I'd like us all just to stand in the presence of God. And those four people, I just I would like the honor and privilege of just praying with you. I'd like you just to step into the aisles and I'd love to pray with you right up front here. If you can just step down here, even if it's, you've done it before, I want you just to come down. Let's pray together. Let's change some destinies. If you need it and you didn't raise your hand, but you need to do that, just step down right now. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. You need to make your life right between you and God tonight. We're going to pray together in a moment. This is your chance. Don't let it go you by. Don't let it pass you by. Let's make things right between you and God tonight. You're going to leave here tonight forgiven. Anybody else that needs to join them? God bless you guys. God bless you. God bless you. Let's pray this prayer. Let's all join them together as we do that. If you didn't raise your hand, but you know you need to pray this prayer, pray it in unity with the people up front. Let's all pray together. Say, Dear Jesus, thank you that you love me. I believe that you are the Son of God, that you came to this earth, you were born as a child, and you grew up to be a man. You went to a cross. You died a horrible death for my sins and for my salvation. I believe you rose from the dead. You're alive right now. You're here in this place. I ask you to forgive my past. Wash my heart with your precious blood. Come into my life. Be my Lord and be my Savior. I give my future to you. Break every chain of the enemy in my life. Set me free that I can serve you and help me to serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. Amen. God bless you guys. God bless you. Amen. You guys, we've got just some, um, some literature and just a few things to give you. If you can just turn to my right, your left, and follow Pastor Joel just a few minutes and your friends will wait for you. And uh, let's give them a hand as they go.